God's grace is yours in Jesus. Amen. God's word for our meditation, Matthew chapter 24, previously read. In the name of Jesus, our Advent King and Savior and fellow redeemed. Have you ever had what you might call unexpected company? I mean, uh, out-of-town friends or relatives just drop in without any advance notice, no warning, and, and you, you welcome them with open arms. A while ago, one of my cousins from Nebraska, who I hadn't seen like forever, shows up on my doorstep. Didn't, didn't call ahead of time, just rang the doorbell. Hi, Robbie. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> great to see you. We had, we had great time together. My, my daughters still talk about the day that Dave Cordy came and told all the stories about the old man when he was younger. <laughs> they got a big kick out of that. There are other times when unexpected company produces kind of the opposite effect. It's like it stresses us out. What? They didn't call. I wasn't ready. When I was a kid, the pastor and his wife sometimes would drop in on my parents, our home, without a lot of advance notice. And I don't know how much advance notice we had. I just remember that we had a thing called the Hoyer Drill. (laughs) <laughs> That's when all four boys went running around the house, throwing their toys in the closet, putting the dishes away as fast as they could before dear Pastor Hoyer walked in the door. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, right? Sometimes unexpected company either produces good feelings or, or stress. Well, today we begin a new church year, the season of Advent, which means the coming right? It's the time when Christians look ahead to the celebration of Jesus' first coming as a babe of Bethlehem, but also look past that to his second coming as the judge of the living and the dead. Our text for today directs our attention to that second coming. God's word says pretty simply today, the Lord is coming. We learn that the timing of His coming is unknown, and therefore we must be ready at all times. The portion of Matthew's Gospel here is a record of this extended discourse that Jesus had with His disciples in the days before His death. As he walks out of Jerusalem past the the temple complex, he makes the comment, the day is coming when not one of these stones will be on the other. And the disciples are going, what? They they ask the natural question, when will that happen? Actually, they, they ask a double question. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answers the second half of their question first. He he points to things like wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and and persecution, false prophets as signs that will precede His second coming. As we look at those signs and we look at the world around us, we realize, boy, Jesus could come at any moment. All the signs have been fulfilled. And yet when it comes to the exact moment of his coming, what does Jesus say? No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, but only the Father. Someone might read those words and go, what, really? Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming? I I thought Jesus was God. Isn't God omniscient? Doesn't he know everything? Yes, that's, that's true. But remember that when Jesus spoke these words, He was in His state of humiliation. As true man, He had set aside 
the full use of His power and glory and knowledge. And so Jesus can truthfully say as a true man, I, I, I know the end is coming, I just don't know exactly when it will happen. He says what we say. I know it's coming, I just don't know when. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of the strepitus. You know what the strepitus is? It's that loud sound at the end of the tenebrae service on Good Friday. It represents the sound of the stone rolling against the tomb. And if you've ever been to a tenebrae service, you know that at the end of the service, when everything's dark and everybody's left, you know it's coming. <laughs> you know there will be this sound. You just don't know exactly when. And so even though you're kind of expecting it, you're still not quite ready. Jesus says that's what Judgment Day will be like. We, we know it's coming. We just don't know exactly when. And yet even though Jesus clearly says that nobody can know when the last day will come, isn't it remarkable how many people have tried to predict it down through the ages? Early church father, Hippolytus, said, Jesus is coming. He's coming in the year 580. Uh, one of Martin Luther's contemporary said, Jesus is coming. He's coming on October 19th, 1533 at exactly 8 a.m. In the 1800s, 1900s, the Jehovah's Witnesses were famous for setting the date of Jesus' return. They'd set a date and then he didn't show up, so they'd just move it and then move it again and then move it again. Early in my ministry, I, somebody sent me in the mail this book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. That's the definition of an obsolete book. <laughs> it is out of print, obviously. All examples of failed attempts to try to set the date of Jesus' return. And yet Jesus here in our text says that because no one can know the date of His return, there are going to be a whole lot of people who are caught off guard by His return. Jesus says that it's going to be just like in the time of the flood. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. You see the point Jesus is making? He, he, he's not really focused on the, how wicked the world was, although that certainly was true. That's why God sent a flood. But rather... He was saying that in spite of all the warnings God gave, I mean, God had Noah preach for 120 years to prepare people for the flood. In, in spite of this major sign that God gave them, I mean, what is a massive ark on dry ground but a sign from God? Still, when the end came, people were totally caught off guard. They were, they were oblivious to what was happening. They were, they were just going on with their lives. They were eating and drinking. They were preoccupied with their earthly lives so that when the end came, they're blindsided. They were swept away by something that for them was totally unexpected. But Jesus draws a parallel to you and me and the end of the world. He says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, when Jesus returns in glory with all of His angels, there's going to be a whole lot of people who are blindsided, who are not ready, who are... Uh, this wasn't. I didn't know this was coming. In fact, it will be so sudden that as Jesus says, 
two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now don't misunderstand those words. A lot of people would use those words to try to prove the rapture, that Jesus is going to take the believers to heaven and leave everybody else here on earth. That's not consistent with Scripture. When Jesus returns, there are only two options. You either go to heaven or hell. There there is no people left behind here on earth. It's that point that Jesus is emphasizing, that in the end, the timing of Jesus' return is unknown. So what does that mean for our lives today? It means that we must be ready at all times. Notice what Jesus says. Therefore, therefore, in other words, in in light of what happened at the day of Noah, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Actually, Jesus uses the illustration of a thief in the night. Right? If, if the owner of the house knew exactly when the thief was coming, boy, he could be standing right there at the door making sure that he didn't do anything. The rest of the night he could you know, take a nap. But the owner doesn't know when the thief is coming. And so he must be vigilant at all times. Jesus draws the parallel so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. You must be ready. So in real terms, what does that mean? You must be ready for the coming of Christ. You and I, someone would say, well, how is that even possible? How can somebody be ready for something that will come at a time when he he least expects it? How can you be ready? Well, you, you can, and here's how. By keeping in mind three truths. Truth number one, even though Jesus hasn't come yet, that doesn't mean he's not coming at all. You realize there's a whole lot of people in our world who believe there will be no judgment day. The Bible talks about those people. In the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Friends, don't get caught in that crowd. Know that Jesus is coming, even if His return is still delayed. What did St. Peter say? The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The only reason Jesus has not come back yet is that He wants a few more people to come to know Him and believe Him and be saved. Truth number two, being ready for Christ's return means being careful how you use the time between now and then. Scripture is filled with warnings about the danger of kind of falling asleep on the job, spiritually speaking. Saying, oh, God, don't worry about me. I'll just be fine. I just want to do what I want to do with my, with my own life. I just will kind of do what I want to do. Did you hear what Paul told you and me in our epistle reading? The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. 
The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about using the time God has given us not to indulge our sinful nature, not to see what we can get away with before Jesus shows up. No, he, now is a time to put aside the deeds of darkness. You know what he's talking about. He's talking about the sins that we commit the sins that other people see us commit and the ones that no one but God sees. He's talking about confessing those sins. But then even more importantly, I mean the most important truth of all, to be truly prepared for Jesus' coming means taking all of those sins and giving them to Jesus and believing Him when He says He's paid for them all. Believing God when He says through the prophet Isaiah, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Believing King David when he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Believing the Apostle Paul. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Believing St. John, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. My friends, isn't that what, what faith is? It's taking God at His Word. Believing His promises. That's what makes you ready for Jesus' return. Being ready for Jesus' return doesn't mean you make sure you're sitting in church 24-7 so you're here when He shows up. Being ready for Jesus' return doesn't mean, boy, hoping and praying that He doesn't show up when you're in the middle of doing something really bad. Being ready for Jesus' return means confessing that by nature we're all really bad. But more importantly, it means believing that by Jesus' blood and righteousness, He's made us right. He's made us good. In, in that sense, the only thing you really need to be ready for Jesus is Jesus. And you have it. Here, in His Word here in His body and blood. You realize what that means? It means that through faith in that Savior, you are ready right now to meet Jesus. Whether you meet Him on the way home in a fatal car accident or you meet Him in a hospital room at the end of a long fight with cancer, or you meet Him when you hear the trumpets and He appears to everybody. You're, you're ready to meet Jesus. Being ready to meet Jesus means saying, Jesus, I don't know when you're coming. But when you do, I'm ready. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what you've done for me. Jesus, in fact, I'll say that when... When you come, because of the promises you've made to me, I'll be expecting you. God keep us in His grace till that glorious final day. Amen.